This is a simple yet very dangerous topic. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we will start a series of very important lectures because of everything that has been going around and the sharp increase in the transmission rates of HIV. I decided why not actually make this HIV week on the channel. So this is actually part one of six videos that I'm going to release excluding a live stream that I would do at the end of these six videos, please make sure that you watch them in order from the first video I will re release to the last video I will release because each of these principles and each of these concepts are going to be building on the prior concepts. I may mention something in the next video that may depend on information that I taught in the first video. And if you haven't watched the first video, then you will be lost. So make sure you watch the videos from start to the end and do not miss anything. So grab your piece of paper, grab your pen and let's go. So there are six parts that I will divide this lecture into because if I discussed everything here, we'll be here for three hours and most of you will be complaining about a three hour lecture. So I thought maybe let me divide it into slots that would make it relevant and it would make the concepts easier to understand. So in this part today, we're going to be looking at the basics of HIV, the morphology, the clinical features, the pathophysiology and the pathologies that are associated, as well as the clinical staging. I will show you a bit of the opportunistic infections as well here and there, but I won't go into details of those because I want to cover them in details when I come to part six. Then part two is going to be pretty much diagnosis in adults, both pregnant and non-pregnant women. So this is going to be inclusive of all the the modalities, meaning all the specialties, meaning internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, and of course, as well as in children. So we should also cover investigation in this same lecture and the schedule of which you test the children. Then of course, we'll come to treatment guidelines in adult patients. So this is both pregnant and non-pregnant women. Then we'll come to the part four, which is treatment guidelines in pediatrics, both prophylaxis and treatment. I already did a video on PEP, and PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, so I will not go over that. If you want to watch that video before you actually watch all these six videos, I will leave a card at the end of the lecture so that you can actually check that video. Then of course, in part five, treatment of HIV in pregnant women. Then of course, part six, you will, will deal a little bit about HIV opportunistic infections. Most of them are actually lectures on their own, as well as the immune reconstitution syndrome and not the iris that everyone really talks about. Then at the end of these six lectures, I will organize for a live stream. Now, do not miss this live stream. Why shouldn't you miss this live stream? It's because it will have relevant questions in relation to HIV on various courses. I'll cover questions that are asked on theory exams, meaning the true or false, the MCQ single best answers. I will cover questions that are asked on essays in internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OBS and gain. I will also look at OSCE station. So it will be, it will be a jam packed session. You do not want to miss that live stream. So I, I once, I release all these videos at the end of HIV week on the channel. We will release those videos. So let's jump right in. So in the vein of actually restructuring my new lectures, I usually start off with the warm up question. So this is a single best answer. A 30 year old HIV infected patient presents with a dry cough of two weeks duration 
weight loss, and night sweats. Abdominal ultrasound reveals hepatosplenomegaly, and chest x-ray revealed symmetrical nodules. The most likely diagnosis is miliary TB, chronic liver disease, malaria, pneumonia, or typhoid. So this is just a single best answer of which I will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So let's jump right in. Remember that HIV is actually a retrovirus. It's going to be an enveloped RNA virus that possesses reverse transcriptase enzyme. And remember that reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that actually allows viral RNA to be transcribed to form DNA. So this DNA can thus be incorporated into the host genome and it can actually remain in the host genome for quite some time. Now, because this reverse transcriptase enzyme it's it's very special why do i say it's very special it's quite error prone it can cause a lot of errors that can happen a lot of misincorporation of bases and remember whenever you change even just a few bases on your nucleic acid what you have created is a whole different thing and this combined with the high rates of viral turnover this leads to actually significant genetic variations, a lot of diversity, such that you create these different strains, these different subtypes. And this is why for many years, HIV has been with us for many years. We haven't yet found a cure. I've only found drugs that are able to virally suppress, but not completely cure. Of course, there are some claims here and there of people that have come up with concoctions, but you can only speculate because in science, seeing is actually believing. If they have cured HIV, then well and good. That should be introduced to all the other countries, but you can only speculate over that. Now, there are several retroviruses. These are going to be including the two types of HIV. There's HIV type 1 and HIV type 2. I'm going to be focusing mostly on HIV type 1 because that is what is common in our setting here in Zambia. Then, of course, you have your two types of your human T lymphotrophic virus. That's your type 1 and type 2. These are also other types of viruses that fall under the retro very day a family. So these can actually cause serious disorders in people. Now, remember that HIV is actually a lentivirus. So it belongs to the genus lentivirus. And the genus lentivirus is actually part of a, of a large family that's known as retroviridae. The bulk majority of these viruses pretty much have the enzyme reverse transcriptase. They are retroviruses. They, they, they multiply by first forming from RNA, then they form DNA that gets Im embedded into the host genome. Now, another family, another uh, rather um, virus, another two important viruses that are actually present in this family are your human T lymphotrophic virus. You have human T lymphotrophic virus one, you have a human T lymphotrophic virus two. These actually belong to the genus Delta retrovirus, not really lentivirus, but Delta retrovirus. Now, these ones have the capability of actually causing leukemias. They may cause lymphomas. They may cause lymphadenopathy. This is actually one of the causes of lymphadenopathy. They may cause hepatosplenomegaly. They may cause skin lesions. They may also cause immunocompromise or immunosuppression. Why am I mentioning this? It's because patients that actually have this human T lymphotrophic virus develop infections that are rather very similar to those that actually have HIV. Now, these ones can also those with human T lymphotrophic virus can actually have myelopathies. They may have a tropical spastic uh, paraparesis. Now, most of the cases of this virus are actually going to be transmitted from mother to child, but you can also have them being transmitted sexually. They may be transmitted through blood and very rarely through organ transplants. We now usually screen for many diseases and many conditions to prevent the transmission of these conditions uh, during organ transplants, during blood donations. Now, let's go into details about HIV. There are pretty much two important types of HIV, type 1 and type 2. So there's HIV 1, HIV 2. HIV 1 is by far the most common occurring strain that we see globally. It is more aggressive than HIV type 2, and it has many groups, many subtypes. I'll talk about the subtypes in the next slide. Then HIV type 2 is almost entirely just confined to the Western Africa. But of course, we're now seeing other cases popping up in different places because people are not just confined to West Africa, but they actually do move to other parts. Then this type of HIV, actually the HIV 2, has about 40% structural homology. So it looks like type 1. 40% of it looks like type 1. 60% is actually quite different. And it's 
it's going to be associated with immunosuppression. It's going to be associated with AIDS, but it takes a very long time. So patients that actually get this type of HIV usually live for quite longer than those that have type 1, which usually tends to be rather more aggressive. Now, many of the drugs that we're going to be using and many of the drugs that we're going to be discussing are drugs that we're going to be using in HIV type 1 are rather ineffective whenever someone has HIV type 2. In some areas, actually in Western Africa, the viruses can actually be both present, the HIV type 1 and type 2, and they may actually co-infect a patient. Now, what are the different groups of type 1, HIV type 1? You have the M group, which is the largest, the O group or the outliers, and the N group. Now, the M group comprises of predominantly nine subtypes, A, B, C, D, there is no E, F, G, H, there is no I, J, and K. Now, this is because this group is very large, okay? And the viruses that are found, the, the subtypes that are found in here can actually now undergo recombination. You can form these major circulating recombinant forms where they now start to mix with each other. The genetic material starts to mix and you get now features of maybe A and E in one virus or A and G in one virus. That creates another problem in terms of resistance to antibiotics, rapid progression of the, the, the virus when it infects an individual. Then, of course, you have the those that are in the O group. These are relatively rare. They're seen in Cameroon and Gambia. Then you have the N group. These are reported only in Cameroon. And, of course, in Africa, more than 75% of the strains recovered are actually type A, C, and D, with C actually being the common type. And of course, in Europe and in America, you have the subtype B, which is the predominant strain. In Asia, you have the recombinant forms, the AE, which is accounting for most of the infections in Southeast Asia. And then the type C is prevalent in India and type B is seen in Asia. Now, what exactly is the origin of HIV? I have actually a pretty, pretty good video on medical myths busted where I actually tackle the different myths in relation to HIV. I think I did an episode on that, on HIV. Now, HIV originated from Central Africa. There is a lot of debate of where HIV truly came. Some people say, no, it was created in the lab, but I'm not going to that propaganda. The theory that I believe makes the most sense is what is known as the hunter theory. Before HIV actually was transmitted to humans, it was first isolated from monkeys, a virus that was referred to as a simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. Now, with this simian immunodeficiency virus, it was quite prevalent in monkeys in that area, and people that were living in that area in Central Africa used to hunt these monkeys. Now, remember, whenever you're hunting monkeys, uh, for whatever reason why you would be hunting monkeys, whether it's for the meat to eat, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to go into that but they were hunting monkeys. You find out that maybe there is a lot of body fluids that are going to be associated, a lot of blood to be specific. So this now makes it easier now, especially if these individuals have a lot of cuts. Because remember that way back when they are hunting these things, it's not like they were, it's modern times where you're using a rifle. You would maybe be running and chasing something barefoot with, let's say, a spear. Then I know this is a very, very typical thing, and I'm sorry for making it so typical then you may have some injuries during the hunting process, some cuts, and there may even be some contact with the blood, the monkey blood, because they, they definitely are not going to be wearing gloves in the, the early years of HIV infection. Now, eventually this virus was transmitted from the monkey onto the human, then in the human it underwent certain mutations, and then eventually... This is, was now renamed and this is what we now call our human immunodeficiency virus or in short, our HIV. So it, even that theory of a person actually sleeping with a monkey, it's out the window. I, I don't think that actually even makes sense. I mean, who would anyways, let me not ask. Moving on. So we have epidemiology. So remember that the, these statistics are not really so, so recent as far back as 2019, over 38 million people are actually living with HIV worldwide. And out of this 38 million, about 1.8 million are children less than 15. That's a very, very huge number. And over 25.7 million are living in sub-Saharan Africa. That's also a very, very huge number. 
And 19% of these cases are actually undiagnosed. And among the infected individuals, 67 of them actually access treatment. In 2019, we had about 690,000 people that actually died from HIV-related illnesses worldwide. And 64%, over half of these individuals, were found in the sub-Saharan Africa as compared to 2004, where we had 1.9 million cases, and then 2010, where we had about 1.4 million. Of course, we can see that the numbers are decreasing, but of course, we're not where we need to be because in 2022, we shouldn't have any new cases. We shouldn't have rise in the HIV transmission because we've been in this for a very long time. If you count the years from 2004 up until 2022, that's a very, very long time. Then, of course, in 2019, about 1.7 million people, including 150,000 children, were newly infected with HIV compared to the 3.4 million that were newly infected in 1996. As we can see, there is an improvement, but we're not yet where we need to be. Why is this so? Because of the different properties of the virus and, of course, the different sexual behaviors or different behaviors of various people in various countries, access to health services. There are many factors that actually are implicated. If you actually read up into the epidemiology of this, you will discover many different things. I actually went on a, on a research about two years ago when we went to the, the northern province of Zambia, where we were trying to discover why the transmission rates of HIV are actually highest from the mother to the child. And we actually discovered so many strange things. We actually discovered that they had quite some weird practices. So this is how when we're interviewing one of the, the women there, she literally thought like this. She, she, we asked her, how many times do you have sexual intercourse with your husband? And she was like, no, we have it a lot during the week. And then we asked them, how often do you use protection? Because, of, of course, the husband also was doing some things on the side. And then she said, this is what she said, and, and this actually got to me. She said, we only use it on one night, and we assume if we just use it on Monday, perhaps, then we're covered for the rest of the week. So there is still a lot of people that do not know about the transmission of HIV, a lot of people that do not know how to prevent from getting HIV. Even in children, they say that when they bath the child, they make the child actually drink the water because it makes them stronger somehow. But a lot of these practices actually facilitate the transmission of HIV. And most of the new infections, about 86% of them are actually going to be found in the developing world and over half of them occur in women, especially women living in the sub-Saharan Africa. Now, HIV is common among th three groups, excuse me, the homosexual men. So initially, homosexuals were the ones that were actually seen with HIV. In developed countries, actually, if someone presents with HIV and they are male, they give them these weird looks because they assume that they are homosexual. So there's a reason why HIV actually transmission is much, much higher in homosexual men than it is in heterosexual men. I'll explain why when we come to the transmission. So homosexual men, this is a very, very huge thing in developed countries because they have legalized all that in, in the different developed countries, some of them. Then, of course, the second thing is coming into contact with infected blood. This is very common in Africa, in South America, in Southern Asia. But, of course, this is significantly reduced because our medicine here is also advancing. So we do screen for some of these infections and we do screen for HIV. So the chances of you actually getting HIV from a blood transfusion are almost close to zero. We never say never because there is a possibility, there is a chance that somewhere, somehow, someone could have made a mistake, but the chances are drastically very, very low. You would be just that unlucky person if you do. And then most of the transmission actually happens through sharing of the needles in terms of blood transfusion, sharing of the needles, especially with intravenous drug users. In some cases, it may be occupational related where you have these needle prick injuries. Then it can be heterosexual through heterosexual intercourse where it equally affects men and women. But of course, the trans transmission dynamics are not really the same. I'll explain. Then, of course, it's common in areas where you have a lot of poverty, a lot of domestic violence, a lot of poor education, poor access to HIV services like testing as well as treating. And we see that all these things actually culminate in increasing the rates of HIV transmission, increasing the the prevalence and the incidence of HIV in a specific country. So countries can actually have 
a few of these factors, but generally homosexuality is more of a problem with the developed countries, heterosexual intercourse, and, and of course the poor access to health, it's more of a problem that we see in developing countries. Now, what are some of the associated infections? These also quite differ when it comes to whether you're in a developed country or developing country. If you're in a developing country, things like tuberculosis and toxoplasmosis become much more common. In developed countries, you have things like mycosis, which is seen in Southwest America, or even histoplasmosis, which is much more common in uh, Midwest America. But then in homosexuals, to be specific, they are actually at risk of the, getting the human herpes virus 8, which actually has been known or has been associated with Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a, a malignant tumor. So this is actually very common in homosexual men that have sexual intercourse with other men. And it's uncommon among HIV patients in developed countries. So whenever they, they actually get this, they assume that this person is homosexual and they have HIV. And however, in our setting here, Kaposi's sarcoma is actually quite common. So how is the morphology of the virus? Remember that this virus is actually spherical shaped. That's the first thing. It's enveloped, so it has an envelope. And in the center, it has an envelope that obviously covers the capsid. Then of course, you have the core on the inside. So in the core, that's where you have the genetic material. So there are two identical strands of positive sense RNA. What do I mean? Two identical strands. So this strand here is exactly the same as this strand here at the bottom. So two identical strands. So it, retroviruses are rather referred to as diploid viruses because they have two identical strands. They're not complementary. Remember the difference. Complementary means that yeah, you have the pairing of these things, opposite things that were supposed to. For example, if you have one nucleotide happens to be in this position, you have the, the other compatible nucleotide in the other position. No, in this case, they are exactly the same, mirror copies. So the genetic uh, material actually has three important genes that I want you to know about. These three important genes, very important to know. There's what is known as the GAG gene, the PO gene, and the ENV gene. So your GAG gene, GAG just simply stands for group specific antigen. So group specific AG's antigen, group specific antigen. So this is going to be determining the core proteins. It's going to be determining the capsid protein. It's going to be determining certain other proteins, matrix proteins. So you have three important proteins that I want you to take note of. P24, it's a capsid protein. This is very important because we can check for this antigen for make, to making a diagnosis of HIV. We can also check for antibodies against this antigen to make a diagnosis of HIV. So we can actually screen for the antigens or the antibodies to make a diagnosis of HIV. Then you have the P7P9, which is the core nucleocapsid protein, and the P17, which is a matrix protein. So that's what the GAG gene actually produces. Then the PO gene here, which I assume stands for polymerase gene, is pretty much going to be encoding for the enzymes. And I want you to remember RIPE. R-I-P-E, not rifampicin isoniazide persinamide in ethambuto, no. But R for reverse transcriptase, I for integrase, which is known as a P32 and P10, then P for protease and E for endonuclease. Then you have the envelope gene, which I presume what is what ENV actually stands for, the envelope gene, where this is going to be coding for certain glycoproteins that are found on the envelope. So you initially synthesize one glycoprotein that's known as GP160. Then GP160 is then going to be cleaved into GP120 and GP41. It's not additive, so don't think that GP160 is equal to GP120 plus GP41. No, that's not how it works. So the GP41 uh, is a transmembrane protein. It's actually going to be a fusion protein. It's what allows the virus to actually fuse with the cells. Then the GP120 is what actually the, the main receptor that binds to the CD4 receptors. Then... The, the two proteins that I talked about that I alluded to in the previous slide, the GP41 and the GP120. So like I said, the GP120 is going to be binding to the CD4 receptors. Now remember that CD4, the cluster of differentiation that is present on special types of cells, white blood cells, your T lymphocytes, your microglial cells, your monocytes, your macrophages, your follicular dendrites, which or your follicular dendritic cells, which are found in the spleen and the liver, as well as your longer hand cells. 
all these cells are susceptible to being infected with HIV because they possess the CD4 receptors. So this is the first point that I want you to keep in mind because when we come to treatment later on in one of the parts of these videos, I will refer back to this receptor because it's very fundamental to understand the life cycle. It's very fundamental to understand these receptors because these are places where we can actually potentially block HIV from actually entering into these cells. And of course, GP41 is the ultimate fusion protein, which allows the HIV virus to fuse with the target cells. Then you have your matrix protein, which is your P17, that stabilizes the envelope. Then the viral core uh, protein, which is, of course, your P24. Like I said, the P24 is a relatively stable protein. It's not going to be associated with entry. It's not going to be associated with fusion antibodies can be made against this protein. Now remember that these antibodies that you're making against this protein are not protective. They will not protect you against HIV. They, if, you make, if you make them, it doesn't mean that HIV can no longer infect you. No, they're not protective. They are only important in our case because we can use them to become diagnostic. So we can screen for either the antigen, the P24 antigen, or we can screen for antibodies in the blood. Then, of course, the enzymes are your RIPE, your reverse transcriptase, which is a characteristic of retroviruses, your integrase, your protease, and your endonuclease, all of which are quite important in the life cycle of the virus. So when this is what happens. When you get the, the GP120 actually binding to the CD4 uh, receptor, which is found on the, the cells, they undergo a conformational change, and then they express two more active sites. Now, these active sites depends on, again, the type of cell that you have. If you have the T helper cells, they express another receptor that's known as a CXCR4. If you have macrophages, if you have monocytes, if you have microglial cells, you may have dendritic cells, you may have longer hand cells, they express what is known as a chemokine receptor 5 or your CCR5. Potentially, this is another place where we can actually give a drug that can block this uh, part so that the HIV cannot actually gain access. In a group of individuals, that I like to call lucky. In a group of lucky individuals, excuse me, in a group of lucky individuals, they have mutations in their, in their DNA such that they lack these receptors. So if they lack both the CCR5 and the CXCR4, they become immune to HIV because HIV cannot enter into the cells. Without this fusion of the main receptor and the core receptors, they can't really, and the HIV can't really infect their cells, so they're rather immune to HIV. Then you have those that usually just lack one of the receptors. These are known as a slow progressors. They usually tend to get HIV and they, it progresses very slowly because it cannot really gain access very quickly to these cells. Then the rest of the, the majority of the population actually have all these receptors and we are actually susceptible to HIV infection. Then once you have the glycoprotein 120 actually binding to the CD4 receptor, then there can be actually fusion of the virus to the, the membrane of the host cell. Then of course this is facilitated by your GP41. Now how exactly is HIV transmitted? So it's going to be contact of body fluids, especially things like blood, semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk, saliva to some extent, or even exudates from a wound, exudates from a skin, or even mucosal lesions that contain the HIV virus. Now, the transmission is actually more likely if you have a higher number of viron particles within that same body fluids. And just typically during a primary infection, even when the infection is asymptomatic, you can actually transmit HIV. Now, the transmission by saliva and by respiratory droplets, so coughing, sneezing, although it's conceivable, it's possible, but... It's highly unlikely, extremely unlikely. I've never heard of a case of someone getting HIV from saliva. Unless if maybe there was a sore or there was an exposed wound and someone just literally comes and licks it, and who would actually do that? And of course, the HIV is actually not going to be transmitted by your non-sexual contact, so it's not going to be transmitted through handshakes, hugs, so things that may happen at work, things that may happen at school, even at home, this usual non-sexual contact does not transmit HIV. Now, how exactly is HIV transmitted? To go into detail of it. So there's a wide range of body fluids and tissues that can actually transmit HIV, but the majority, the bulk majority, is either through semen, cervical secretions, or blood. Now, this can happen through sexual intercourse. It can be homosexual intercourse, or it can be uh, heterosexual intercourse. 
or it can happen through mother to child transmission or it can happen through blood and blood products or organs blood donations or intravenous drug users or intravenous needles needle stick needle stick injuries of course these have become very very sig insignificant because we screen for blood products we screen for organs so there's actually no evidence that hiv is going to be spread through social or even household contact there's no evidence that hiv is spread through mosquitoes or bugs otherwise a lot of people would have actually had HIV. If one mosquito bites someone with HIV, goes and bites another person who doesn't have HIV, then they can get HIV. I think potentially it's because the virus, largely actually even in the blood, doesn't remain for a long time. It, it remains hidden actually in the lymphoid tissues. Now, let's talk about sexual contact, sexual intercourse, because it is one of the major ways in which HIV is transmitted. 90% of the cases is transmitted through this. It may either be through vaginal sex or it may be through anal sex now different sexual practices actually increase the risk of hiv compared to others but the rule of thumb is this any sexual practice that actually facilitates or causes mucosal ulceration it causes mucosal membrane inflammation is going to facilitate transmission why if there's inflammation you're bringing those cells that are susceptible to being infected with the hiv towards that site so it makes it easy for the virus to actually infect these cells. If there's a mucosal ulceration, again, it's very easy for the viral particles to gain access into the body. Now, the passage, actually, if you're talking about, we'll start to talk about uh, the heterosexual sex. So if you are, you are having a male and a female having sexual intercourse, it is actually much easier or much more efficient for the virus to transmit from a man to a woman than it is from a woman to a man. So it means that if a man has HIV, it's very easy for this man to infect another woman. But if a woman has HIV, it's not so easy to infect the man with HIV. And I think this makes sense because of the surface area. If you look at the surface area over the, the penis versus the surface area of the vaginal epithelium and everything in those regions, it's much huger. So uh, huge, I don't even know what's happening to my English. Larger. So... This makes some sense to me. Then, of course, it's also much, much larger, especially in anal intercourse, because anal sex is actually a, it's a high-risk behavior for transmission of HIV. The reason being the anal mucosa is not meant for this in-and-out business. No, it's quite thin, it's quite fragile, and there are a lot of langer hand cells. There are a lot of these in the rectal mucosa that are susceptible to being infected with the, the HIV. Then vaginal sex is actually an effective form of transmission. And what we have actually realized is that patients that have sexually transmitted infections, so things like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, are at much higher risk. Several folds much higher than those that do not have because the quantity of the virus in the semen, the quantity of the virus in the vaginal fluids is significantly increased. Even the number of monocytes in the area, in the genital area, is significantly increased. And of course, individuals that also have ulcerative sexually transmitted infections like chancroid, uh, herpes uh, simplex, then you also have the syphilis, have higher rates of transmission. Then of course, other abnormal sexual practices, things like fisting, where an individual gets a hand, either part of the hand or even the whole hand and sticks it into the rectum or vagina for whatever possible reason. I do not want to enter into that. Use of sex toys during uh, sexual intercourse with an HIV infected patient, actually even with multiple concurrent sexual partners, increases the risk of transmission. Oral sex, to some extent, puts someone at risk, but it's not significant risk. There, there hasn't been any significant cases that have been reported of HIV being transmitted through oral sex. The only time that this can happen is if someone may have maybe sores or open sores in their mouth or along their GIT. And of course, if someone ejaculates or rather there is some fluids that you actually swallow. Then, of course, there has been a lot that has been talked about about circumcision and the reduction of transmission of HIV. So let me just talk about that right now. So remember that circumcision actually reduces the risk of males acquiring HIV by about 50 to 60 percent. Why is this so? Because when someone is circumcised, the foreskin is removed. And remember that beneath the foreskin, you have susceptible 
epithelium, susceptible mucosa on the aspect there. So once you remove that, the, the epithelium that you leave behind is your keratinized stratified epithelium, which is rather more resistant to actually the HIV infection and thereby reducing the transmission of HIV. But remember that it's not only with HIV, but also with HPV transmission. Because now the foreskin may be a, a, a pouch where you may have collection of dirt, collection of, especially if someone is unhygienic. And then this may form what is known as smegma, which may actually accumulate in that area and can actually facilitate growth of the HPV and it can sustain HPV in that area. And this can actually, men can actually act as carriers. So it not only reduces the risk of HIV transmission, it also reduces the risk of HPV transmission. Remember that HPV has been implicated in cervical cancer. Now, recent evidence is that HIV infected patients, those that are on effective therapy, at least I could say more than six months of effective therapy, and those that have reduced viral load below the current set standards, the detectable levels of what we, we term someone to be virally suppressed. I'll talk about in the lecture when I talk about the diagnosis and monitoring of HIV patients, then if someone is virally suppressed below the certain level, then there's literally almost zero risk of them actually going to transmit the virus of, to their partner who is HIV negative. Of course, they can be infected. If they go sleep with someone who is HIV positive, you may get infected with a different strain. And this is what people don't seem to actually get. They say, okay, I have HIV, then what? I can sleep around and be unprotected. But what you don't know is that there are different strains and you actually get infected with different strains. So you may actually think that... Um, Using this evidence that we actually have, it's, it's, it's very easy now to actually even conclude that if someone has undetectable viral levels in their bloodstream, then it's most likely that they won't be able to transmit the virus. Now here is a table that shows you the different uh, possible risks. So you have no risk, theoretical risk, low risk, and high risk. So here there's no risk unless if someone has sores that are present. So things like a dry kissing, which I presume is without saliva. Please comment in the section below about what dry kissing is. I, I presume it's that. Okay, then body to body rubbing and massage. Then you have using unshared inserted sexual devices like sex toys, genital stimulation by a partner, but there's no contact with semen or vaginal fluid bathing or showering together, contact with uh, feces or skin if the sk or, or urine if the skin is intact. So there's literally no risk of getting HIV in these scenarios. And then theoretically, here with these things, there's a theoretical risk of you getting the infection, but it's very low, extremely low, unless if they're open wounds or open sores that are present. So things like wet kissing, which I presume is saliva, of course you would have had to drink a drum of saliva for you to get HIV. Anyways, I'm only joking. Then you have fellatio. I don't know if I've pronounced that right, fellatio. This is pretty much oral sex that's done to a man. So if there is no ejaculation or if a condom is used, then the theoretical risk is very low. Then you have um, kalinas, or, or kalin, kalin, kalingas, kalinas, kalingas, I don't know. Kalinas, which is pretty much... Um, the oral sex that's done to a female, I don't know if I've pronounced it right or I've butchered the word, if a barrier is used. And of course, if there's oral to anal contact, I don't know, there are some people who like doing weird things. Then of course, the digital uh, vaginal or anal penetration with or without a glove. And then of course, uh, use of shared but disinfected inserted sexual devices. Then of course, uh, low risk, um, the oral sex with the females, with the, with the males without a condom and with ejaculation, as well as with, with the females without a barrier. Then, of course, vaginal or anal intercourse, if a condom is used correctly, then use of shared but not disinfected inserted sexual devices. These have a low risk. Then high risk is, of course, vaginal or anal intercourse with or without ejaculation if a condom is not used and if it's, you, if it's not used in the correct manner. That's with sexual transmission. Then we have mother to child transmission. Now remember that the bulk majority of the transmission is going to be happening during labor, during delivery. Because remember, during the pregnancy, the woman, the HIV uh, is not, most of the times it's not going to be transmitted from the mother to child. And rule of thumb is this, if the mother had the infection before she fell pregnant, it's unlikely that the child will get the infection. But if the mother acquires the infection during the pregnancy, it is more likely that this infection will be passed on from the mother to the child. So 
during pregnancy, it's about 10% before the third trimester, 70%, the bulk majority of it is happening in the late pregnancy and during labor because you have cutting of the umbilical cord and mixing of blood. Then of course, you have breastfeeding, which is 10 to 15%. And remember that HIV is actually ex ex HIV is actually excreted in breast milk. Now, this is known as a vertical transmission. It's associated with mothers that have advanced disease, those that are not taking medication, those that are not virally suppressed, those that have a high viral load. So it's very important to check the viral load, very important to check the CD4 count of this mother. Actually, before she actually even decides to fall pregnant, there should be what is known as uh, the, the pre-pregnancy counseling or the the antenatal or rather i don't even know what the, what it, um, the term has lost has left my mind but she should be screened for these things and this should be actually advocated in all the countries there's a very very bad practice especially in zambia of people not wanting to go to the hospital for just a routine checkup even though they are okay then of course a prolonged and premature rupture of membranes even chorioamnionitis actually increase the, ri the risks of transmission of HIV from the mother to the child. Now with breastfeeding, for some time I usually had the confusion as in how. We usually tell mothers who are HIV positive exclusively breastfeed. But then if the HIV virus is inside the breast milk, then why then are we telling mothers to exclusively breastfeed? Why are we telling them to breastfeed? Aren't we going to pass the virus on to the child? Well... I had this confusion until I read somewhere and someone actually opened my mind and they said mixed feeding practices is what actually predisposes the child to infection. What do I mean? If a child is just put on breast milk alone, and of course breast milk is much better for a baby or a newborn child as compared to formula milk, but if you want to completely eliminate the risk of transmission, you can put the child on formula milk. That's not a problem as well. So... If someone is just on breast milk for six months at least, then, or at most six months rather, not at least, at most six months, the gut, the gut wall and the lining of the mucosa, it's assumed that it remains intact. So even if the breast milk has the HIV within it, it's not easy for the virus now to penetrate into the enterocytes or penetrate into the susceptible cells. Now, when you mixed feed, there may be some micro abrasions of other foods that you're feeding the child that may cause now tears and some micro abrasions inside the GIT and some form of inflammation in the GIT that may now bring these cells that are susceptible to being infected with the HIV to that area and it can actually facilitate easy transmission. So remember that the rates of transmission actually reduce by treating patients with your antiretroviral drugs during pregnancy during labor as well as during breastfeeding so as long as the mother is on treatment and remember that now we don't even wait for the cd4 count to fall to a certain level to start treatment if today you're found with hiv you can even be started with treatment today we actually say that all patients with hiv must have started treatment yesterday meaning that there's no reason why you should delay starting someone on treatment unless otherwise they have certain other conditions that you suspect that maybe they may go into an iris, which I shall talk about later on. And it has been shown that cesarean section delivery as well as prophylaxis for those children that are born to HIV positive mother has significantly reduced the risk of transmission from the mother to the child. Then when it comes to blood and blood products, so you may have some, we usually test for these P24 antigen, we test for the antibodies, especially even in the window period, we test for all these things to prevent someone from donating blood that has HIV, to, to prevent someone from receiving blood that has HIV, to prevent organ transplants from someone that has HIV. So they must be screened. And actually transmission of HIV through these blood and blood products is now less than one patient in two million units transfused. So this is a very, very, very low number. But of course, it still does happen. It's not completely zero. Then the organs like the kidney, the liver, the heart, the pancreas, the bone, and even the skin that are transplanted, the bone marrow, and even the skin that are transplanted can potentially transmit HIV. And then of course, it, it's also been seen with artificial insemination. That's why we now do what is known as a sperm washing, which actually is a, an effective method of reducing the risk of transmission of HIV. And of course, through contaminated needles, intravenous drug users, infections, and even needle stick injuries, which are very common among health professions like you and I who are watching this video right now. Then this may be occupational, meaning that they're related to work or non-occupational, not related to work. So the risk is about one in 1,300 
without any post-exposure prophylaxis for you to get the HIV. And then immediate prophylaxis actually reduces this risk to about 1 in 1,500. And of course, the risk is much higher if there is a deeper wound, if there is blood that is present on the needle, and of course, if you use a hollow needle, one that has a, has a, a hollow bore in the needle, and because remember that blood can be present. And of course, if the, the, the needle actually punctures into the artery, it punctures into the vein. So the depth also really matters. The solid needles are not going to be rather associated with um, the uh, transmission unless if you have large volumes of blood that are being transferred. And of course, shared needles actually intravenous drug users are at risk of transmitting not only HIV, but even other bloodborne infections like hepatitis B. Now, interesting enough, in 1980s, in the 1980s, there was a dentist that actually transmitted HIV to over six patients, but we're not so sure how he transmitted the HIV to over those six patients. Then, of course, what's the life cycle? This one here is very important, the most important aspect for you to learn. Why is it important? Because this helps you now pick out where you're going to be putting the drugs that you're going to be treating these HIV patients. So the first step is attachment, binding, and fusion. So you have now the GP120 is going to be binding to the CD4 receptor. Then it's going to express another receptor and the co-receptors, your CCR5, your CXCR4. Eventually, G, there's going to be a conformational change, and then GP41 will cause fusion of the HIV into your host cell. Then the virus undergoes uncoating. So this releases the viral capsid, it releases the viral RNA into the cytoplasm along with the enzymes. Now remember that there is a special enzyme which is known as reverse transcriptase, which has a, an RNA dependent DNA polymerase, meaning that it uses RNA from the virus to convert it into double-stranded DNA, which is known as a provirus. So it creates this double-stranded DNA. Then this double-stranded DNA or this provirus is then translocated and imported into the nucleus of the cell. Then with the, with the help of integrase, it actually embeds itself within the, the genome. So the proviral DNA embeds itself into the host genome. Then you have now transcription of this same HIV that has been embedded, and then you form RNA. Some of the RNA is transported to form other HIV proteins. Some of the RNA is actually moved to the cell membrane. And this is how your immune system actually tells that, okay, this cell is infected by HIV. But of course, there are ways in which the, the virus actually, excuse me, there are ways in which the virus actually uh, ev evades all these things and we'll actually look at the reasons why it's it's we see that there's a decrease in the cd4 count then of course there's viral assembly where the hiv is actually assembled just underneath the cell membrane and then it buds off it, it takes a bit of some membrane from the cell itself remember the rule of thumb is this cells that are uh, have an envelope usually are going to be budding off so they don't kill the cell that remains behind but the cells that lack an envelope, usually they'll lyse the cell and they'll kill off the cell. Then of course, maturation, you have the viral protease enzyme that cleaves the longer proteins into important viral proteins. And then this converts the immature viral particle into an infectious HIV. Then it can actually infect other cells. And each cell is actually going to be providing or producing thousands of virions. So here's the life cycle that's actually depicted here on the picture. You have your step one here, which is, of course, interaction of the CD4 receptor with your GP120. Then, of course, you also have expression of the CCR5, the chemokine receptor 5, and the CXCR4. And, of course, this leads to uncoating and fusion, rather, which is facilitated by GP41 and eventually uncoating of the virus into the cytoplasm. RNA is then transcribed or through reverse transcriptase into double-stranded DNA, which is eventually translocated into the nucleus and then eventually embeds into the host genome by the help of integrase enzyme. Then, of course, this forms the RNA intermediates, some of which are used to make structural proteins, some of which are going to be the viral genome. And then, of course, there's assembly of the viral proteins with the help of the uh, protease enzymes, and then eventually they bud off and mature to infect other cells, completing the life cycle. This is very important because potentially we can use these different slots to create possible drugs that can treat HIV. So one such thing is a drug that can inhibit these co-receptors. 
and it also inhibits the fusion of these receptors. We call these as the entry or fusion inhibitors. So these are only effective if someone hasn't had the HIV infection before. If they have, they are pretty useless. Then, of course, we can also give a drug, the two drugs that can block this reverse transcriptase. I'll talk about all these in details when I talk about treatment. We call this as a reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They may either be nucleoside or non-nucleoside. We can give a drug that inhibits the integration step, integrase inhibitors. We can give a drug that inhibits this protease enzyme. We call those as protease inhibitors. Those are the bulk majority of the drugs that we're actually going to be using in the treatment of HIV. Now, what's the pathogenesis? Remember that the cells that are going to be infected are the CD4 lymphocytes. 98% of the, these infected CD4 lymphocytes produce 98% of the plasma HIV variants. Then, of course, the subset of these infected CD4 lymphocytes actually are going to be reservoirs for the HIV. So they, it keeps reactivating, it keeps replenishing. If the, if the patient actually stops antiretroviral therapy, the virus will now come back and reactivate it will keep uh, making these variants and this person will still be sick. That's why if someone has HIV, they are on treatment lifelong. Then of course, in moderate to heavy infection, about 10 to the power 8 and 10 to the power 9 variants are created and removed daily. Not even weekly, uh-uh, daily. And of course, the average half-life in plasma of HIV is about 36 hours, about 24 hours if it's within the cells, and then about 6 hours if it's uh, outside the cells. Then, of course, 5 to 10% of the CD4 cells actually turn, their, their turnover in increases, and uh, they are they're turned over daily. They are killed daily. And, of course, this actually decreases the pool of the CD4 cells because even their half-life of the CD4 cells actually reduces. And remember that as this is going on, this is going to result in AIDS. As you have the, the CD4 count actually dropping and the, the immune system weakening, then this can predispose certain uh, malignancies forming. It can predispose certain conditions which are known as AIDS defining conditions actually coming up. And that's how we say that the patient has AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So HIV leads to AIDS. So the high volume of HIV replication, the high frequency of transcription errors actually of the HIV reverse transcriptase and the mutations that we actually see, this actually is what brings a, a rise to uh, strains that are resistant to the host immunity, strains that are resistant to the drugs. Of course, we can offer some resistance testing that I will talk about uh, later on. Then what are the consequences of getting a viral infection, an HIV viral infection? Infection. So this may actually damage the immune system, specifically the CD4 cells. Now, the CD4 cells are the ones that are going to be damaged. This may also lead to immune activation. So your own immune system may be causing you problems in terms of HIV infection. Now, what do I mean? So remember that the CD4 cells are going to be quite central to both the cell-mediated immunity, especially the cell-mediated immunity, and to some extent the antibody-mediated immunity. Now remember that the, the problem here in someone who has HIV is that the CD4 cells are gradually decreasing. What is causing these CD4 cells to gradually decrease? There are some mechanisms that have been proposed. One thing is that you have what is known as a HIV-mediated direct cytotoxicity. So pretty much all cells that are infected with the CD4, they begin to be killed by your own immune system. The immune system starts to kill off these cells. So if you kill these cells, the CD4 count begins to drop. Second thing is you may find, form what is known as an HIV-mediated syncytia formation, where you get a large a cell-like structure, which is as a result of fusion of many of these cells. It's very common, especially with viral infections. This can also lessen the number of free circulating CD4 cells that are active. Then, of course, you may have a defect in uh, the CD4 T cell regeneration. This is because the rates of destruction are much, much higher than the rates of which these can actually be regenerated. So the body cannot keep up. In essence, there's also going to be a decrease in CD4 count and an increase in the CD8 cells. Remember that the CD8 cells are the, 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 the T killer cells. They kill off the cells that are infected with the virus. Then, of course, you have also HIV-specific immune response. So here, the immune system is going to kill the ones that are guilty, even the ones that are innocent. It's like a mass shooting. It just comes and kills everyone. So it kills the virally infected cells, even death of the innocent cells. You may also have some autoimmune mechanisms that may be also associated, even programmed cell death, which is apoptosis of the infected cells. So in the systems, 
you may have a hyperplasia of the B cells in the lymph nodes. So you, this may actually cause lymphadenopathy. And you may have secretion of antibodies to previously encountered antigens. If they encountered these antigens way back before they got the infection, the, the HIV infection, then this is going to lead to a condition that's known as hyper globulinemia, where they have a lot of these antibodies, but it's just due to antigens that were exposed to these patients a long time ago. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we're going to see that there's going to be a, an increase in the total IgA uh, levels, an increase in the total IgG levels, and they are quite unusually high. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the newer antigens that they're exposed to, for example, if you give a vaccine to someone with a progressed uh, HIV infection, then this actually, there won't be any significant response because there is a significant decrease in the CD4 count. There's an abnormal elevation of the immune activation, and this may actually be caused by absorption of different components from the bowel bacteria. So this may actually cause the immune system to be activated. And then this immune activation actually can contribute to killing off the CD4 cells that can contribute to the further immunosuppression. But of course, these mechanisms remain unclear. Now, the infected CD4 cells, actually, the half-life of these cells reduces to about two days, which is actually much, much shorter than an uninfect, an uninfected CD4 cells. Also, the rates of destruction of the CD4 cells, excuse me, the rates of destruction of the CD4 cells are much higher if you have higher levels of the virus. So if this person is not high, virally suppressed, so it's like they move in opposite directions. The higher the CD4 count, the, low, the, the higher the CD4 count, the lower the viral load. The higher the viral load, the lower the CD4 count. And of course, during the primary infection, the HIVs are actually much as highest. You get more than 10 to the power 8 copies per mil, and the CD4 count begins to rapidly drop. And of course, the normal CD4 count is roughly about 750 cells per microliter, and the immunity is minimally affected if they have a CD4 count that's within these ranges. And if the CD4 count is greater than 350, the immune system is usually holds up. But if the count drops to less than 200, that's when you get this loss of cell-mediated immunity. This is now opens up the floodgates of opportunistic infections happening and even reactivation of these latent infections that you carried or you kept. Things like TB can now begin to show up. Then, of course, HIV can affect different tissues and cells. So the the non-lymphoid monocytic cells like dendrites or dendritic cells in the skin, the macrophages, the microglial cells in the brain can be affected. Cells of the brain, the genital tract, the heart, and even the kidneys can be affected. And what we have actually, there's something interesting that we have actually realized. If a person gets an HIV infection, and this virus is actually isolated from maybe the brain or different compartments from the brain, the CSF even from the genital tract, like semen and cervical fluid versus the, the viral particles that are isolated from the plasma. Genetically, they actually have different structures. Why is this so? Possibly we assume that the virus that is in the different compartments undergoes different adaptations and different mutations that allow them to adapt to those compartments where they are found. So you'll usually find out that you have different resistance patterns of different tissues. That's a very, very interesting thing to actually know about HIV. Then, of course, the plasma levels are expressed as the number of HIV RNA copies per mil or per microliter of blood. Then usually they stabilize after six months at a set level. So they have a set viral load. So usually it varies between 30,000 to about 100,000 copies per mil or if you're using uh, the log 10 per mil, it's about 4.2 to 4 log 10 per mil. Then, of course, the higher the set point, the more quicker the CD4 count is going to 4. And remember that a 4 that's below 200 cells, that predisposes them to opportunistic infections and cancers, which are actually going to be defining our acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Now, how does HIV progress? There are four main groups or four main people. You can fall under four of these. This is a natural progression of the disease. You have the rapid progressors. These are accounted for 15%. So these are going to be quickly developing opportunistic infections and they die within two to three years. You have the normal progressors, which is the bulk majority of the population, 80% of the people. So these remain healthy for roughly about six to eight years before they actually start having the overt clinical manifestations. You have the long-term survivors. So these are people who are going to be remaining 
alive for 10 to 15 years after the initial infection. And in most, the disease might actually have progressed and you may even have some evidences of immunodeficiency. Then you have the long-term non-progressors. These ones have had the infection with HIV for more than 10 years. Their CD4 count may be in the normal ranges and they may even remain clinically stable for several years. So you would want to aim to actually be a long-term non-progressor if you got the HIV virus. If you already have it, then, or if you have already gotten it, if you haven't, then don't pray to get it. So the factors that actually affect progression, you have your immune response. So those that have a high CD8 uh, count, the CD8 cells, they're they slow progressors. Those that have a low CD8 cells, they're rapid decliners, so they rapidly decline. This makes sense because the CD8 cells are the ones that kill off the virally infected cells. So if you kill off a lot of those, then the progression will be rather slow. Then of course the viral type, remember if you get HIV type 2, it's much slower course compared to HIV type 1. And also the presence of other comorbidities, things like malnutrition may actually quicken the progression of HIV. Even chronic infections can actually quicken the progression of HIV like TB. Now, what are some of the clinical features? I, I will end this lecture by looking at clinical features and staging of HIV, and that's where we'll end this lecture and then look forward to part two of the lecture. So clinical features of HIV. Initially, the patient is going to be asymptomatic, so they may have this transient, nonspecific symptoms, what we call an acute retroviral syndrome. It begins usually about one to four weeks of the infection, and it lasts about one week to 14 days, so one to two weeks, about three days to 14 days. Now, this is very similar to infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever. Remember, infectious mononucleosis is caused by EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. So you're going to be having things like fever, malaise, fatigue, several types of dermatitis, sore throat, joint pains, which are arthralgias, generalized lymphadenopathy, and even septic meningitis in some cases. So there may be seroconversion, which is the time it takes the body to make the antibodies against the HIV. And it varies in different individuals. It may take 3 to 12 weeks. So they may have lymphadenopathy. They may be having pharyngitis, systemic symptoms like fever, malaise, pain with muscle aches, headaches. You may have GI symptoms like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You may have a maculopapular rash. And this lasts 1 to 2 weeks. So after these symptoms disappear, whether the patient is on treatment or they are not, sometimes they may become asymptomatic. So a few people who actually have mild symptoms, but the bulk majority become asymptomatic and they may, may become asymptomatic for even about 2 to 15 years, depending on what type of progressor they are. Now, the, the clinical symptoms can actually be presented by, by systems. Here I've included both the opportunistic infections as well as opportunistic uh, malignancies. And we'll talk about these in greater detail. So this is just a list to help allude to the lecture that we'll look at when you talk about HIV opportunistic infections in iris. So we have some neurological manifestations in the CNS like toxoplasma encephalitis, which is a protozoa infection. Here you get some focal neurological signs. Cryptococcal meningitis, which is one of the most common causes of meningitis in HIV patients. Cryptococcal and TB, those are the two things that you should remember. This is a fungal infection caused by cryptococcal, neoformans. Then, of course, it causes this insidious chronic type of meningitis without any significant neck stiffness. You may have primary cerebral lymphomas, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is, known, which is caused by JC virus. This, of course, is not Jesus Christ. Then, of course, you have HIV dementia, which causes this gradual the decline in the neurological function in the absence of other infections. And of course, you may have HIV and neuropathy. You may have CMV retinitis. CMV just simply stands for cytomegalovirus. It gives you a, a mozzarella pizza sign on fundoscopy. I'll show you what CMV looks like on fundoscopy. And then you may have respiratory uh, infections or rather respiratory presentations. They may present with pneumocystis gyrovaci pneumonia. Remember, it's no longer called pneumocystis carini. Pneumocystis carini infects rats. So we now renamed it as pneumocystis gyrovaci pneumonia. So this is a fungal infection. It causes a dry cough. Here the patient actually desaturates very quickly. You also may have sweats. They may have shortness of breath. 
Then of course, you have other fungal infections like Aspergillus, Cryptococcus, Histoplasma. TB is very common. It may be your typical pulmonary TB or your atypical forms of TB or even your disseminated forms of TB like miliary TB, TB meningitis, even TB osteomyelitis. Strep and even staph pneumonias are common. Even cytomegalovirus infections of the respiratory tract are also common. This is what CMV actually, CMV retinitis looks like on fundoscopy. We'll cover this when we look at ophthalmology. Then, of course, moving on, in the mouth, you may have oral and esophageal candidiasis. I will show you a picture. Oral hairy leukoplakia, where you have these non-malignant white growths on the lateral aspect of the tongue. These are also caused by Epstein-Barr virus. I will show you a picture as well of this. Then we have the herpes simplex virus, which, as well as the aphthous ulcers. I'll show you what aphthous ulcers actually look like. In the gastrointestinal system, you may have cryptosporidiosis. Which causes a, which is caused by a protozoa, which is a cryptosporidium pavum, which causes chronic diarrhea. You may have CMV colitis. You may have HIV Westing syndrome, where someone has this unexplained weight loss greater than ten percent. You may also have your mycobacterium avium complex affecting the GIT, the lungs, or it may be disseminated. Fungal infections like cryptococcus. Uh, you may also have histoplasma. Other bacteria like Salmonella, Shigella, Hepatitis B, and C. You may also have skin infections or skin malignancies. So things like multidermatoma zoster, shingles. I'll show you what that looks like. Recalcitrant psoriasis. You may also have Kaposi sarcoma, which is caused by human herpes virus 8. You get these purple. It may be uh, patches, macules, papules, plagues. You see them on the face. You see them on the mouth. On the back, the lower limbs or the genitalia, they can affect the GIT and they can affect the respiratory system. I'll also show you what they look like. Then, of course, there are some cancers like B-cell lymphomas, EBV-related. You may have cervical, anal cancer, HPV-related. You may even have lung cancer, head and neck cancers. And, of course, here I've grouped now the infections based on the CD4 count. Now, between 200 to 500 cells, TB, Candida, Varicella zoster virus, Kaposi sarcoma, other pneumonias are very common. 100 to 200, you have your pneumocystis gerivaci, your histoplasmosis, your progressive multi multifocal leukoencephalopathy. 50 to 100, that's where you have your atypical TB, your CMV retinitis or colitis, toxoplasma becomes common, cryptosporidiosis, cryptococcal meningitis becomes common. Less than 50, that's where you have your mycobacterium avium complex. Here is what after ulcers look like. So here's an aphthous ulcer here. Here you have multiple aphthous, aphthous ulcers. Here is what candidiasis. This is known as oral candidiasis or thrush. I put them on the same image here so that you don't confuse them. This is oral thrush. This is oral candidiasis. Now this one on the lateral aspect of the tongue, this is known as oral hairy leukoplakia. So this is a possible scenario that they can actually bring for you on your OSCE stations. They bring you this and you have this knee-jerk response and say, oh, this is oral candidiasis and you're even right, caused by your uh, candida albicans. Meanwhile, it's wrong. It's oral hairy leukoplakia, which is caused by EBV. Then, of course, this is what shingles look like. Remember, it's going along the, de the dermatomes. Here's Kaposi sarcoma. The first, the early lesions are seen on the on the palate. So look on the palate, you see these purple lesions. Whenever you're examining patients, look at the palate, see these purple lesions. They may present you in this manner. I once saw a patient that actually presented it's quite similar to this. This is a very, very common one on OSCE stations where you get these purple-like presentations on your OSCE stations. And this is all Kaposi sarcoma. It's also a topic on its own. Now, how do we stage patients with... HIV, this is the last thing that I'll talk about. So there are two staging systems. There's a WHO staging system. There's a CDC staging system. The WHO staging system is rather a clinical one. So it looks at patients and puts them into four stages. Asymptomatic, minor symptoms, moderate symptoms, and AIDS-defining illnesses. Then those that are staged according to the CDC here, those that are at stage one, they have a CD4 count greater than 500. Those that are at stage two, a CD4 count 200 to 499, so we can just say 200 to 500. Stage 3, those that have a CD4 count less than 200. So these are known as, a, they have defining opportunistic infections. Now, the CD4 count after about 1 to 2 years of treatment actually provides an indication of the ultimate immune recovery, whether this person is getting better because you expect it to rise. Then, of course, it may not return to the normal range, but uh, you do expect it to rise. Here is the clinical staging. As you have seen, there are two bars, this side and this side. 
this is how you should use this table. I'm not going to go through the entire table. I'll just give you highlights here and there to give you an idea. I'll, I'll leave this here so that you can get a screenshot. I will also share this PowerPoint presentation in my Telegram group. So on this side, on the left side here, you have your children that are zero to less than 10 years. Adolescents between 10 and 15, you use this side here. Then on this side with adolescents, pregnant women, adults, you use this side here on the right. So this is how it's like. Stage one, they are asymptomatic or they may have persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. That's about it for both these cases. Stage two, this is where you should know the keyword here. The keyword that you should keep in mind is oral mucocutaneous lesions. So it means that they have things like herpes zoster, things affecting the skin and the oral mucosa. Recurrent oral ulcerations in the kids, herpes zoster, your recurrent infections, your skin manifestations, pretty much your popular pruritic eruptions or your PPEs. So oral cutaneous manifestations. You can also say mild to moderate bacterial infections, recurrent bacterial infections. Then stage three here, the hallmark is moderate to severe infections, moderate to severe infections. So you have things like your unexplained malnutrition, your unexplained weight loss greater than 10%, in the adults here and then in the children, you have things like oral hairy leukoplakia. You have things like pulmonary TB. Remember, pulmonary TB and oral candidiasis are stage three. Esophageal candidiasis is stage four. And extra pulmonary TB is stage four. Then, of course, stage four is very easy to remember because these are the AIDS-defining illnesses. Your opportunistic infections, your malignancies, you all group them under stage four. So take your time to actually go through each and one of these. It's a very, very exhaustful list. This is from the latest guidelines. Go through it, have a read, understand, because they may sometimes bring you a bunch of these symptoms and they may ask you to actually classify them according to the different stages. Coming back to our warm-up question, we have a 30-year-old HIV-infected patient who presents with a dry cough of two weeks duration, weight loss, night sweats, abdominal ultrasound reveals hepatosplenomegaly, and chest x-ray reveals symmetrical nodules. This actually even gives you the answer. Whenever you see the symmetrical nodules, the weight loss, the night sweats, and these are constitutional symptoms of TB. So most likely this patient has miliary TB. I really hope you enjoyed this first part of HIV and it opened your mind and the horizon to the how bulky this topic is and the important details that you actually really need to know on this topic. Stay tuned to watch part two. Do not miss part two. Do not miss any of these lectures. We shall see you in the next video. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.